alone at 6,200 meters high on a tiny piece of rock and with no hope of rescue, as even a helicopter can't reach that height. With no food, water, fire, or phone, the climber was just stuck there for a whole seven days on an uncharted slope of one of Pakistan's most extraordinary mountains. His story shook the climbing community, but what happened? And did the climber manage to survive? As always, viewer discretion is advised. In July 2018, three climbers were descending from the mountain's nearly vertical slope, and as soon as they crossed the 5,800 meter mark, rocks started incessantly falling on them. No matter how they dodged, chunks of rock kept hitting them. They smashed one guy's helmet and broke another's rib. Moreover, it was abnormally warm up there, with snow melting at five kilometers high, forming entire waterfalls. The exhausted, battered climbers had no choice but to continue descending under icy water streams and rock falls. And when they were just a stone's throw away from the base camp, they got caught in an avalanche. Luckily, they all managed to survive and get out, all except for two of their companions. Alexander Gukov and Sergei Glazunov decided to conquer Latak Mountain in Pakistan, no matter what, and despite the avalanche, rock falls, and warnings from other climbers, kept moving toward the summit. In fact, it's a cluster of four rocky peaks ranging from almost 6,456 to 7,145 meters high. It's a natural phenomenon. With only about 20 such mountains in the world, in climbing, Latak Mountains are called Big Wall because the rocks here rise up at an angle of at least 70 degrees, if not completely vertical. The length of such steep sections is over 1,000 meters, but that's not the only difficulty of climbing Latak summits. Climbing along the mountain's ridge is impossible because it's covered with gigantic seracs, sharp, unstable ice formations that can collapse at any moment. So climbers have to ascend a steep wall where there's often not even a big enough ledge to stand on. They also have to overcome many traverses, horizontal transitions, which are especially dangerous and challenging on Latak. Moreover, for such a climb, one must master both ice and rock climbing skills perfectly. Although all four peaks were conquered, no one had yet managed to pass through the northern ridge of Latak 1 at that time. So Glazunov and Gukov set out on July 20th, 2018 to tackle this unconquered ridge. Initially, a third climber was supposed to join the Russians, Glazunov's brother, Yevgeny. However, at the last moment, they argued, and the duo set off alone. Maybe if they had taken a third person with them, what happened later could have been avoided. The climbers were just a stone's throw away from the summit when suddenly a thick fog enveloped the peak and visibility dropped to zero. Gukov's satellite tracker had long died, but just a few hours ago, it showed that they only had to climb another 100 meters. However, neither of the climbers knew exactly where they were. Then, Glazunov, who was leading the way, yelled to his partner that he had reached the summit because the path ahead was downhill, and it seemed like the climbers should have been overjoyed, yet that wasn't the case. Firstly, due to the extremely challenging conditions at the summit, Glazunov couldn't help Gukov climb up as well. So, it turned out that one reached the peak while the other didn't. In addition, the men suspected they weren't on the right summit. The thing is, the ridge the climbers were on leads to two summits the west and the main. To get from the lower one to the higher one, you first have to descend a bit, traverse a 300 meter horizontal section, and then ascend another 100 meters to the main summit. So, no matter which peak Glazunov climbed, he would see a descent ahead of him. However, the climber was convinced he was on the main summit, while his partner thought they were on the west one. This is one of the reasons why climbers prefer to go in groups of three. So, in case of uncertainty, there are more witnesses, on July 24th, when the weather turned sour completely, the climbers decided to descend immediately. By that time, Gukov and Glazunov had spent 10 days practically without sleep, rest, food, or communication with the outside world on the rock. The trio of Russians who descended earlier started to worry, so they equipped a helicopter and set off in search. They quickly spotted them at an altitude of 6,700 meters, and the climbers signaled that they were okay and didn't need help. The duo only asked for a few supplies because theirs had run out a few days earlier. So Gukov and Glazunov received some sausages, chocolate bars, and a gas burner from the helicopter and were left to continue their ascent. And almost immediately after that, a catastrophe occurred. The climbers were at an altitude of 6,200 meters and descending on a snow slope. Glazunov was leading 
and Gukov was belaying him. He had to wait until the rope stopped and the tension eased, indicating that Glazunov had finished the descent and secured the belay anchor. Only then could the second climber move toward his partner. However, on the next slope, Glazunov disappeared from sight and didn't release the tension on the rope for a very long time. Gukov started calling for his partner but heard no response, although it's often the case in the mountains. Suddenly, the climber felt the tension on the rope weaken and he began to descend. When Gukov reached where his partner was supposed to be, he saw only the anchor attached to one hook. Gukov was struck by the realization that Sergei Glazunov had fallen and most likely passed away. Almost immediately though, the shock of this tragedy turned into horror. Gukov was left alone high on the treacherous mountain where a storm was about to hit, practically without gear and supplies because everything that was dropped to the climbers from the helicopter went over the cliff with his partner and all the descent equipment, which usually belongs to the one leading, was gone. All Gukov had left was half a chocolate bar, a tent, and a drained tracker. What to do next? How could he possibly survive under such conditions? His only faint hope was that the drained satellite phone would magically turn on, and he could send an SOS signal. Indeed, at lunchtime on July 25th, with the battery at its last 2%, Gukov's device finally turned on. The man sent his coordinates, a request for evacuation, and the news of his partner's death. The colleagues of the Russian climber immediately began to organize a rescue operation. Alexander Gukov received a short, encouraging message. Hold on, a helicopter is on the way. After 40 minutes, when two teams of the Pakistani army were ready to take off, Lotok was hit by an unprecedented storm. Gukov managed to set up a tent on a tiny ledge and at least partially shield himself from the weather but it didn't save him from rock falls and avalanches that were constantly happening around him. So the whole day passed and the weather cleared by morning. The climber's mood slightly improved because nothing prevented him from being rescued. He listened for hours yet didn't hear the noise of approaching helicopters. So he sent another SOS signal and waited. Although it was clear at the summit, the storm raged below and the rescuers couldn't physically keep the helicopters in the air. On the third day, Gukov's tracker finally died for good, and the weather didn't improve. In one of his last messages, he wrote in despair that he might just lose his life on that rock in the mountains. The man couldn't know if they would continue to search for him. After all, a mountain rescue operation cost a crazy amount, and they might not have the money to rescue him. However, in reality, they were just waiting for the weather to improve at the base camp, and the forecasters predicted it for July 28th. Instead, the storm intensified even more, completely covering the mountain, and Alexander Gukov's condition was deteriorating. He had been buried by several avalanches already, and he constantly had to dig himself out to avoid suffocating under the dense snow. The climber's consciousness began to fade when suddenly, a helicopter arrived, and a rescuer reached out his hand to Gukov. Ecstatic with happiness, the climber was about to unclip the rescue rope, which he had strapped to the rock, only, to come to his senses when he dangled his leg over the precipice on the slope of Latakwan. Hallucinations began for Gukov, and if, at first, he could still distinguish between what was a hallucination and what wasn't, later, this boundary was completely blurred. He felt like the mountain was a living being holding him captive, and the climber begged to be released. So, lost in hallucinations, without food or water, half buried in the snow, Alexander Gukov spent a week on the rock. Even through the hallucinations, Alexander heard the sound of helicopter rotors and realized it was real. On July 31st, the sky finally cleared and rescuers were sent to Gukov. Unfortunately, the helicopters could only rise to a maximum altitude of 6,200 meters, while Alexander was 200 meters higher. Clearly, he couldn't descend any lower, so the military had to remove the helicopter doors and siphon off some fuel to minimize its weight. Hypothetically, this would allow them to reach the stranded climber, but the pilots couldn't take the rescuer on board. Exhausted and frostbitten, Alexander, who had spent a week on a frozen piece of rock, had to somehow get himself on board the helicopter. The climber knew that in such a situation, he would be rescued using a long line, a special rope he would securely attach to himself. Then, with Gukov wenched up into the helicopter, he would be transported to the hospital. Reality was different, though. 
Hearing the helicopter noise, Alexander began to dig himself out from under the snow with his bare hands because he had lost his gloves. He realized it would be extremely difficult for the pilots to reach him and hover so close to the mountain for him to reach the long line. Trying several times or waiting for him to prepare was simply not an option. When the helicopter finally arrived, instead of a special rope, Gukov was thrown a regular rope with a carabiner at the end. Thus, there was no plan to pull him into the helicopter. Gukov would simply hang underneath it. But the man didn't think about that. The only thing that mattered was that he caught it. With trembling hands, Gukov first secured himself to the carabiner, then reached for the safety rope attached to the wall. However, when he tried to unscrew the nut on the carabiner, it turned out to be frozen. Panic engulfed the climber again. He tried to warm the nut with his breath, but nothing worked. When the detail finally began to give in, Gukov realized that the pilots had started to lift the helicopter. He hadn't had time to unclip himself from the self belay and there was no time left for that. The next moment, the climber was suspended between two taut ropes, and the helicopter jerked downward and swung to the side of the rock. He had only a few meters to crash into the mountain, taking Gukov's life and everyone on board. Fortunately, the pilots managed to stabilize the helicopter at the last moment. Right after that, one of the climber's safety ropes broke, and he felt a short drop and a strong jerk, and then he was turned upside down. Miraculously, it was the safety rope attached to the mountain that broke, and not the rope from the helicopter, and Gukov was just hanging upside down on it until he was lowered onto the nearby glacier. Now, the climber was safe. He was taken to the hospital where it turned out that miraculously, the man had not received any serious injuries. Besides exhaustion, almost nothing bothered him. There wasn't even a severe frostbite, even though he was without gloves. So, Although the abnormal heat in the mountains threatened the climber with rock falls and avalanches, it also probably saved him from terrible cold injuries. But Alexander Gukov's survival in such a tough situation was primarily due to his own skills. He behaved literally as described in all mountaineering books. He coped with panic, sent out an SOS signal, assessed his chances, and just waited. $50,000 were spent on the climber's rescue operation, 30 of which went only to service the helicopters. However, the survivor, Gukov, had to pay another price for his rescue. His story became known all over the world, and accusations rained down on him, including the murder of his comrade, Sergei Glazunov. Allegedly, the climber deliberately cut the safety rope of his partner. Some people didn't believe Gukov when he told what happened on the slope of Latak 1. And since the man was the only witness, he couldn't refute these accusations. Still, the accusations of Sergei's brother morally undermined Gukov. Yevgeny Glazunov condemned him for allegedly not even trying to find his missing partner, although he was believed to be only 40 meters below where Gukov was stuck, and Sergei Glazunov's body remained in the mountains of Pakistan forever. However, there was another thing that bothered Alexander Gukov. This was the second time he had narrowly escaped death in the mountains of Pakistan. The first time, he was planning to conquer Latak 1 in the summer of 2013. He had only a few days left before the flight when the horrific news shocked the whole civilized world. Terrorists attacked the base camp near the foot of Nanga Parbat, killing 11 people. Only by coincidence was Gukov's trip planned a few days later. That is, to some extent, he managed to avoid death in the Karakoram Mountains twice. But if the first time, chance saved him. The second time, it was professionalism, both his own and that of the rescuers. So, something in this world may still depend on us. If you know other incredible rescue stories and want me to tell them, write about them in the comments.